let's start with the last session of today on track C. So we start with Dominic Barry that will talk about uh, quantum simulation of solid state materials. Good, thank you. So this work is essentially on the topic. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Okay, so this work is on the topic of how to make quantum computers do useful things. So here we're trying to simulate solid state materials, which can be used, say, for designing things like batteries. So this is the latest in a sequence of work on how to do these simulations more efficiently. And this time we're using pseudo-potentials, which is the key word here. Um, and this is work in collaboration with uh, a lot of people, including group of, of Ryan Babush, uh, the, uh, the Google Quantum AI, and also like to thank uh, Nick Rubin, who's doing some of the work on the um, chemistry in this part. So, and do we have a... So we've got a lock on this thing that's showing. No? There we go. Hmm. Now, there, now it's working. Okay. <laughs> so this is, um, a, there's been a whole long sequence of work on improving complexity of quantum simulations. So on this page, we're looking at the second quantized versions using molecular orbitals. So the idea here is that you're trying to find some small set of orbitals to represent a, a chemical system more compactly. So you might have something which is quite a complicated molecule, but can be represented with only say 100 orbitals or so, which is quite a small number. But since the classical complexity of simulating this is going exponentially in the number of orbitals, that's going to be classically intractable. So the capital N that you see here, it, that's the number of orbitals. So there's been a whole sequence of successive works on the simulation complexity in quantum algorithms, starting with NC11 or NC9, and that's polynomial, but since it's such a large power, that's going to be an uh, intractable complexity on a quantum computer, down to, say, into the third for our work on tensor hypercontraction. So a lot of this work is based on trying to give more compact representations of the Hamiltonian. So a major difficulty with these types of approaches is that because you're trying to work out these very clever orbitals, you have to work out some integrals to work out coefficients in the Hamiltonian. And these are all classically calculated in advance. And all this classically calculated data needs to be fed into the quantum algorithm. And what, uh, approaches like factorization and tensor hypercontraction are being used to reduce the amount of data that's being fed in. But an, here we go. An alternative approach, which can be used to avoid needing to feed in data, is to use a simpler type of orbitals. So this is the plane waves approach. And we're particularly interested in the case where the orbitals are corresponding to electron momenta. Now, the, the advantage of this is that you get a potential which now has a very simple functional form. So you just have something like a 1 over k nu squared here in these weightings. And this means that instead of needing to feed in classical data, you can just essentially compute things on the fly inside the quantum algorithm. But the drawback is that to get a, a, a sufficient accuracy, you're actually needing to use a much larger number of orbitals. So you might be needing to use, say, a uh, 100 or a 1,000 times more than the number of molecular orbitals you'd be using in the previous slide. And this means that if you are using the same sort of representation as in the previous slide, what we call the second quantized version, where each orbital is needing a qubit, that'd be a totally unmanageable amount of the qubits to use. So instead we use what's called first quantization, 
where we have a bunch of registers which are recording the occupied orbitals. So each of these registers is essentially corresponding to an electron momentum in our representation. Now, with this larger value of n, you can actually get, sorry, you can actually get these much better scaling in n as well. So even though the n is larger, an n to the, n to the one third scaling is going to give you much better performance than the n to the third scaling with the smaller n before. But the difficulty with this is that it's not really taking advantage of active spaces like with the molecular orbitals. So the idea with the active space is if you, is if you have, say, an atom which has some um, the core electrons and then some outer electrons, typically these core electrons, they're always going to be in that orbital. So you don't really need to simulate them. Yep. Ah, yes, good question. So the eta is the number of electrons. So um, they're not, we're, we're generally trying to reduce the scaling with the eta as well, but it's typically going to be much smaller than n. And oh, I'm going the correct way. So th uh, this is where we uh, use the pseudo potentials. This is essentially to get the effect of these active spaces. So rather than just having the bare nuclei in the simulation, we're grouping inner electrons with the nucleus and then have an effective potential where which is smoothing off the singularity of the nucleus. And this is a not only softening the singularity at the core, it's also reducing the number of electrons that need to be simulated. So both of these are giving us an improvement in the complexity. But the challenge is that this um, the, the, is much harder to simulate because the functions are now harder. So we have much more complicated functions rather than just a one over k nu squared. So the full version of this is looking something like this. So you have these weightings of k nu squared here in this representation, and you have things in this round brackets here, which you can think of as effectively like a unit tree. So this is a bit like a linear combination of unit trees form of an operator, which we have very nice ways of simulating. So that's the original version of plane waves. So if you're going to pseudo potentials, you're getting something that looks like this. So you can see going from here to here, it's just this weighting that's changing. But the difficulty is that this is not just the only part of the pseudo potential. This is what's called the local pseudo potential. There's also a non-local pseudo potential as well. And you see here that this function has gone inside this sum now. So this is dependent on Q here. And this Q is going to correspond to an electron momentum. I should mention as well that I'm emitting a, few, a couple of sums to simplify things. So this is just a term for a single um, the register for an electron momentum and a single nucleus. So you're also going to have the sum over the electron registers and nuclei. So to give you a speed course in block encoding and linear combination of unit trees, so the idea is that say you have some target system, then imagine you have an ancilla. So the idea is say you've given this Hamiltonian as a linear combination of these unit trees U nu, with weights a w nu, the preparation is giving you this superposition with square roots of weights. You, you do a controlled unit tree inverse prepare and project onto zero. What you're getting is that Hamiltonian applied to the target state. And another very important feature of this is that you have this divide by lambda here. This lambda is a sum of weights, sum of absolute values, and this is governing the complexity of the overall simulation. Now, you might be, say, trying to estimate eigenvalues, or you might be trying to do time-dependent evolution, but in either case, the complexity is going to be proportional to that lambda, so it's important to make that as small as you can. This uh, divide by lambda is also accounting for the fact that this projection onto zero isn't deterministic. But in the actual simulation, we're not actually doing that. This is just 
an abstraction to understand a further procedure we're using to construct a quantum walk that we can use for the time evolution, which I don't have time to explain further, but this is the key thing that we're trying to do is this block encoding of the unit tree. So in the local pseudo potential case, we basically have this linear combination of unit trees form where you have with this sum with weights like this and essentially unit trees in brackets. So this prepare is giving you the square roots of these weights. And then for the unit tree, you want a shift of the wave number by mu and the nuclear position is coming into it in this phase factor here. But then when you're trying to deal with the non-local pseudo potential, you also need an amplitude which is changing according to the system state. So this is no longer a unit tree thing. This is a bit like we're replacing this controlled unit tree with some other non-unit tree thing which also needs to be block encoded. So there's sort of this two layers of things which need a uh, functional evaluation for the block encoding. So we're going to have a prepare which is giving us weights over new and another step which is giving us weights dependent on Q. And what we what they try to do in the algorithm is to actually make this much simpler and bundle most of the complexity of preparing weights like this into this part with the non-local pseudo potential. So this is what our functions look like. So <laughs> this is our local pseudo potential. And this is our non-local pseudo potential. So I've written it here in terms of these functions f tilde and the f tildes are polynomials in K with an exponential. So the difficulties in this are coming about from that sum and from the exponential. So the general idea in simplifying the implementation of this is that for the sum, we're wanting to do a linear combination of unit trees style approach to implement it. So the idea there is that we have some control register that's prepared in a superposition over L, I, and J. So that's in addition to the superposition over new. So what this means is that we only need to do function evaluation using sort of coherent arithmetic on the quantum processor for the argument we don't need to do an explicit sum. And the other feature of this is that if you remember before these Fs, these are the only parts with, which have exponentials in them. And when we have products of Fs, we can bundle the two exponentials together as well. So for everything that we're seeing in the sums, we only need one exponential. So in this block encoding, what we can do is compute what the argument of the exponential needs to be. And then we do this coherent evaluation of the exponential. So that's really the hardest function to evaluate here. Everything else is just additions and multiplications. Then for the exponential, what we have is a QROM interpolation. So QROM is something essentially, if you're thinking of having some register which is storing Z, so the Z here would be something where we're working out a two to the minus Z, which is just based a slightly adjusted exponential. And we, for each value of Z, we want to output some data. So we have some nice circuits to do that. Um, and then the data that's output is actually giving us information for each of these little segments here. So each of these segments is going to be a polynomial interpolation. So basically, it's giving you the value of Z, and it's giving you, uh, say, a slope and an intercept and a quadratic term for an interpolation between these points. And then that means that the overall complexity of this is just a QROM, which actually has quite a small cost. The number of Toffolis is just going like the number of points you see there. And then some multiplications and so forth for the polynomial. So this is what we get for a few interesting materials. And the key column here is on the right, which is costs for block encodings. So these are in terms of counting Toffolis. So you see here, there's a range of say 20,000 to 50,000. But for a lot of these, a lot of the cost is just for accessing the registers with the electron momentum. 
So what this is telling us is essentially we've optimised the evaluation of the pseudo-potential functions as much as is reasonable to give the best performance. But then the other thing we need to look at is the values of the lambda. So if you remember before, this was what's governing the complexity and this is coming from or essentially block encoding something like the Hamiltonian divided by the lambda. And this is a bit like a sum over weights. But the other thing is that because we're needing to have this separate preparation over new and ampl amplitudes according to values of new and electron momenta, that's actually going to be changing the values of lambda that we get. So the values of new are prepared according to this scheme with nested boxes. So the new is in this three-dimensional space. And essentially, if you look at the inner nested boxes, you'd be preparing all the same weights for new. Then if you look at this box, excluding that inner box, you're preparing the same weights for new again. But the weights for new have to be the maximum over the actual weights that we want. And then the value of lambda is going to correspond to that essentially sum over the maximum in there instead of the summing over the actual values. So that's actually boosting the values of lambda that we get for the pseudo potentials. So if we now look at the results for these materials, we're actually getting quite large values for the non local pseudo potentials. This is the local pseudo potentials and then kinetic term and electron electron potentials. So we have maybe, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> five minutes. I'm, I'm running a little bit fast because <laughs> I was uh, originally planning for a 25 minute talk and then they said, oh, you should do your talk in 20 minutes. Okay, so you can, um, if you look at sort of the tightest possible values of the lambdas that you could get here. If you were able to prepare the values, the function over new perfectly, you could maybe save a factor of 10, but that would be a much more difficult calculation. So you would have to have some much more difficult cal the, uh, calculations for new, which would be increasing the Toffoli complexity of the block encoding as well. So here's the example for the battery cathodes, and this is comparing to another work that we did uh, earlier using a, a, a different approach, and that's shown as these bars here for a couple of example materials. So the idea is that if you can simulate batteries, you can design them for, say, batteries without a cobalt, and the classical simulation of these things tends to be, be, um, be, be quite challenging and give some incorrect predictions. So in these cases, our Toffoli counts for our pseudo-potential approach are actually quite a lot larger than what it was for our earlier approach. So a, uh, this is suggesting, oh, well, maybe the pseudo potentials aren't doing so well, but the drawback here is these are actually requiring a whole lot of ancillas. So what these are doing is they're using sort of a similar approach to the molecular orbitals case that I was showing on the first slide, except taking advantage of symmetries to reduce the amount of data. But there's still a lot of classical data that needs to be fed in there with a variation of the Curon that's a bit different than what I illustrated before. But this is using a whole lot of extra ancillas to reduce the Toffoli count. And the number of ancillas that you end up using there is about 75,000. And that is expected to be really not usable in an algorithm for a size and quantum computer that's foreseeable. So, Say you're doing things in the surface code and have 4,000 physical qubits per logical qubit, then that's asking for 300 million physical qubits, which is a bit too much, whereas this is the, um, going down to about uh, just over 1,000 logical qubits, which is far more manageable with the pseudo-potential case. 
but as well, like if we could make this uh, implementation with the lambdas uh, are more efficient, then we could be, uh, be possibly making the Toffoli counts here similar to what it was in this earlier scheme. Okay, so I'll wrap up there and I'll just, uh, quickly mention the archive paper. And thanks everybody, I'll open the floor for questions. So I'm wondering if our system is not periodic, yep. um, does this method still have advantage? Ah, that's a good question. So it can be used for periodic, non-periodic systems, but it's tricky. So something that I, I skipped over a little bit because I realized that just before the talk that I had five minutes less than I thought was that the molecular orbitals case is really designed for molecules Whereas a plane wave case is more designed for periodic materials. So you can imagine also using it for non-periodic systems where say you have some sort of large box and effectively sort of periodic copies of the system which are far away enough from each other, they're not, not really affecting each other. But it's, um, it's expected that's probably not quite as good as just directly using molecular orbitals. But the scaling is still better, right? Like um, maybe the overhead is big, but... Yeah, yeah. So th this is where sort of the trade-off between number of orbitals versus scaling with the number of orbitals comes in. So you can, in theory, have this n to the one-third scaling, which is better with the number of orbitals. And But if for practical systems, you might need so many more orbitals and also you have that scaling with the number of electrons that it might end up actually giving you worse complexity. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. This is really interesting work. Um, so for the part of the quantum circuit that synthesizes the lambda values, yep. those circuits involve a lot of small angle rotations, right? Small angle Z rotations. Um, is that correct? Um, um, like you're you're synthesizing these small angle rotations yeah, with T gates. Yeah, not, the... not really. We're we're not really doing much in the way of small angle rotations. This is more sort of trying to get the correct uh, amplitudes in there. So even if uh, when we are doing small angle rotations, that's adding things into a phase gradient register. So then, then everything's quantified in terms of Toffoli's. Um, so, uh, so then what part of the circuit is yielding all the T gates? Well, uh, most of what we have is essentially coherent version of classical arithmetic. So you have things right. like additions and multiplications, and then we right. translate so that into Toffoli's. That there's part of the circuit that is large dominated by Toffoli's, right? But yeah. is the entire circuit uh, dominant? Is the entire quantum circuit, like its T-gate complexity comes from Toffoli's or are there parts of the quantum circuit? Yeah, that... so we so so we have the Toffoli's for the, essentially calculating these functions. We also have Toffoli's which are being used to select uh, these electron momentum registers, which is another thing which is um, a, a, a fairly important factor in the complexity, which I didn't have time to go into. And the only thing where we're really putting angles in is if you remember, we had that, um, had that e to the i factor with the, um, the nuclear position. So that's a phase factor. But this is pretty negligible contribution to the complexity. So we're just, because we're just, calculating this thing coherently in the argument of the exponential, and then that's being used to add into a phase gradient register for the phase rotation. I see, that's very interesting. So um, the vast majority of the cost comes exclusively from Toffoli gates. Yeah, yeah. I see, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So in interest of time, maybe we should keep the other questions offline. So let's thank Dominique again. Thank you.